Uh, let's get started. Hi, hello, welcome. Uh, welcome to the fully open source smart OpenStack Cloud, now and beyond session. My name is Ash Palgat. I'm Senior Director for Cloud Marketing at Mellanox Technologies. Uh, what I do for Mellanox is work, uh, kind of develop our cloud uh, market and work with the partner ecosystem as well as the open source ecosystem and do solution marketing um, to bring exciting solutions for the cloud market. Uh, telco happens to be one of that market as well because telco is becoming telco cloud now. I also want to introduce my colleagues here. Uh, Frank Bodin, who is a NFE product manager. A lot of people might know him. Uh, he's from Red Hat. And also Mark Iskra who's a technical marketing expert, and he's from Nuage Networks uh, by Nokia. So uh, we have an exciting topic today, and uh, we're gonna go through a lot of stuff. Um, let me introduce the agenda a little bit. Um, what we all know is that uh, the telco networks have uh, gone through a major shift, a transformation, changing from the traditional um, you know, networks that are built for service providers to now becoming cloud-based networks. So I think today's talk is a lot more about how that has evolution has happened, what are the components of those evolutions, and then how does it all come together in the open source, and uh, what's happened already, what's gonna happen next. So we're gonna break this session into two parts. One is the what's happening now with the Telco Cloud, um, and why is there a need for offloads? Uh, and what we mean by offloads is hardware offloads. Um, what are smart NICs? There's a lot of you know, buzz around smart NICs. So what are the smart NICs? and uh, how the offloads work on the smart NICs. What are the open source elements that are enabling these offloads? Uh, because you know, we want to make sure that we have uh, networks that are now agile and programmable and flexible. So that's very important. Open source is important. Um, and we are going to share a lot of different uh, information on that. Frank is going to touch upon all of that. And then how does this all get deployed? So there's a live, well, it's not a live demo, but we have recorded this demo uh, in the interest of time. And Mark is going to do that demo. So that's basically to recap what's happening now in the telco cloud, and then we're gonna go into the beyond where we'll talk about what are the next set of things that are also needed in order to make uh, all of this deployable. So without uh, any further ado, let's get into the agenda. Uh, let me take a little moment to talk about what's happening in the telco cloud, right? As we know, for a long time since 1980s, almost 40 years back, we have been having networks built in a monolithic manner. And what that means by monolithic is we have been having proprietary purpose-built appliances for anything and everything, from layer one to layer seven. Anything that's needed, a router, a switch, a load balancer, a firewall, CDN, whatever you need, you had an appliance, there's a vendor who's building it. And that's been how we have been building networks for years, right? Uh, that's called a hardware-defined everything world, which is basically hardware is the king. Uh, hardware is how things have been defined, and everything is put into the hardware. There's no virtualization, there's no disaggregation uh, of any kind, there's no flexibility, right? So it's a very monolithic model. What we realized in 2007 is that that model is extremely difficult to kind of really uh, be agile, be uh, faster to deploy new features, uh, be able to recognize revenue faster. And so we have in 2007 something called a software-defined everything world. And what that meant is let's move all of the intelligence from the hardware into software and make the hardware commoditized. Right? So we can use standard high volume servers, standard high volume um, storage uh, nodes, and also uh, commodity switches, right? And that's all great. And then put all of the brain software programming into the software defined networks, the network function virtualization, all of those uh, new, new ideas, new concepts came up. And that's the software defined everything world. However, if you look at it, we started pretty much uh, on the commoditized servers with bare metal kind of infrastructure with a lot of cores available. But as we add uh, virtualization, as we add software-defined uh, security, software-defined uh, storage, software-defined networking, everything software-defined and virtualized, a lot of these cores are being taken up. So the green cores is what is available, and uh, the other cores are all being chewed up for packet processing, for protocols, for overlay networking, all sort of things. Um, and essentially what happens is then you have very less cores available for running your applications, your VNFs, your containerized workloads, and that's not really scalable. What you achieved basically in doing, going from the bare metal to the software-defined uh, world, which is in the middle, is that you sacrifice the performance, you sacrifice the efficiency, and you basically defeated the purpose of why you want to go software-defined to begin with. Um, so how do you really gain back this efficiency? 
is something called a smart NICs on the right hand side. You can see that. What we are doing is smart NICs are the regular NICs that look like regular NICs, but they have smart offload capabilities. And what that means is all of this packet processing um, for networking, for overlays, for storage, um, for virtualization is all been pushed into purpose built silicon. ASICs could be FPGAs, could be uh, CPUs, uh, could be GPUs basically, that can all do this efficiently than a general purpose processor. So what happens is you have a smart NIC who's at the bottom, which is doing all the heavy lifting, and at the top you have the, the cores that are all freed up. And that's really what the smart NIC revolution is, right, in a nutshell. Um, so let's recap basically what happened, right? This is a pendulum, right? What we see is started on a hardware-defined everything world, which is pretty much like a bare metal kind of um, scenario. We don't have any virtualization, purpose-built, everything. We went to the software-defined world, which everything becomes extremely flexible, but then you sacrifice the performance, you sacrifice the efficiency of the infrastructure. Then you figure out, oh, the light bulb went up, right? Light bulb went up. We said, okay, we need something that's in the middle. Let's find an equilibrium in the pendulum, which says, okay, let's have a hardware accelerated, software defined one. And what happens in that story is basically you have the smart NICs, the blue components that are kind of doing the heavy lifting for packet processing, for networking, for storage, for virtualization, that helping you to get the efficiency of your software defined world. So you get the best of both sides, a flexible infrastructure, but also uh, high performance and high efficient. Right. One of the key components here is uh, Open vSwitch. As you know, um, Open vSwitch is a very popular virtual switch out there in the open stack world. Uh, it is part of the hypervisor. Um, and I think an example of uh, why virtualization or disaggregation could really be, or programmability, how that really impacts the performance, um, although OES is really massively deployed, it has issues, right? And we all know that, basically. There's, there's uh, packet performance that you can get less than one million packets per second if you, did, if you dedicate two to four cores. Uh, it consumes a lot of CPU. Uh, even with 12 cores, you can't get less than you know, up to 30 gig uh, of throughput. Uh, so that's one third of a 100 gig NIC if you're using that. Uh, you cannot even realize the line rate on that. And you have a poor latency, and uh, because the latency issues, you have poor uh, user experience. So you really cannot really rely on a virtual switch that's kind of dropping the packets. Um, and essentially, this is a key component of a virtualiz virtualized infrastructure. And that's what we are trying to see. How do we accelerate this whole thing? So the talk for today is about how do we accelerate a uh, key component like OVS, or open virtual switch, but could be also applied to other virtual switches and other virtual routers. But let's take OVS because that's what OpenStack community is using really heavily. So how do we do this all, right? Um, so folks are familiar with OVS, I'm assuming. I'm not gonna go into all the details of what OVS does, how it works, how it programs, uh, how, does it, how does it manage the flows, how does it classify the flows, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially, what we are doing is we are offloading um, the flows from an OVS into a e-switch of the NIC. Um, and that basically is the way to kind of achieve what you're doing, uh, a hardware accelerated um, you know, and SDN controlled uh, faster data plane, right? So essentially in an OBS offload world, what happens is we get the uh, open vSwitch as a standard SDN controller, and we also get the OBS data plane offload to the NIC embedded e-switch, and that's using SRIOV for the data path. So data path is really fast, but it's also programmable because you're offloading the OBS rules into the e-switch of the NIC. That's really the beauty of it. And if you look at it um, from, a sim from a packet flow standpoint, you first normally, if you do not have the hardware offload, what happens is every packet that's coming in um, on, a, on a slow path, right, the, the orange one, goes up all the way to the OBS switch D when you don't have a rule available. You program the rule from the OBS switch D to the kernel, OBS module, and then you're basically always slow, slow path, basically switching in the kernel. But what happens with the hardware switch, which is offloading the OBS rules, is all of that rules, those are in the OBS kernel, also get programmed into the e-switch all the way to the bottom, like it shows in the diagram on the left. The flow offload happens there. And then what happens is all the subsequent packets are all hardware switched. So it's really fast path, express path, and that's the green route. So you don't have to go to any more to the kernel or to the user space. All of the packets are quickly classified match and action happens, and then you're right away switching the packets quickly. So this is a quick uh, example of how the pipeline works. Um, this is the open flow example, for example. See how you can take the uh, flows, you can classify the flows based on classification criteria, as you might have, five tuples, for example. And then you can put the actions on that, right? So this is something that's programmable in the e-switch today. 
So the eSwitch can let you uh, classify on you know, five tuples, for example, and then you can uh, take actions like drop the packets or forward the packets, rewrite the headers in the packet. You can do mirroring. You can do overlay, end cap, decap, telemetry, increment, decrement, counters. All kind of things are possible. And that's really important for applications such as NATing, load balancing, ACLs, you know, firewalls, basically DDoS. All of that stuff can really take advantage of that. It's all offloaded into the switch. It doesn't have to go in the software path. It can be offloaded in the hardware path. One of the questions that comes up is, uh, what about DPDK? And we all know what is DPDK. It's Data Plane uh, Development Kit. And it's a technology that is actually helping to improve the performance. Uh, however, it's a software acceleration technology. And what that means is it consumes uh, your CPU for the PMDs. Uh, you lock up the cores from the CPU. And then you're uh, using the CPU to do the work still, right? You know, in terms of really uh, pull mode drivers uh, using and pulling it on a certain time intervals. So that gives you the performance efficiency, not as much as what you can get with a hardware offload, uh, but you still are going to consume CPUs. So I think uh, Mellorox has really great performance for the DPDK. If you're doing it in the application, really great. Using DPDK for your VNFs, for your containerized workloads is great. However, using DPDK for OBS uh, is not the best solution. You should really go to the hardware offload solution. That's called Mellorox brand name for the OBS hardware offload is ASAP squared. That's accelerated switching and packet processing. That's what we brand it as. But essentially, it's eight times to 10 times uh, better than, uh, in terms of the performance, it's better than the OBS DPDK. Uh, and all of that as zero CPU utilization. So the cores that we talked about before, those get freed up, is basically what we do when we have the hardware offload. We don't use any CPUs, unlike with DPDK. Um, here's a quick example, you know, comparison of the OBS DPDK performance versus the performance of OBS offload. We can see that with uh, about two cores dedicated for DPDK, uh, for running the OBS over DPDK, you can get about 7.6 million packets per second. And uh, you can pretty much use zero CPU for doing 66 million packets per second using the hardware offload. So that's an order of magnitude almost, right? I mean, a little bit less, but 8 to 10x is what I said. Your mileage will vary. But essentially, it's, uh, it's a huge difference in terms of performance. And this is for all small packets. You're talking 64-byte packets which is really a, a very good performance for a lot, of, uh, a lot of networks that need high bandwidth. And all of this is not done in isolation. So although I talked about Mellanox a little bit here and there, but you know, all of this architecture for OBS hardware offload is uh, it's an open architecture, right? We, of course, have an e-switch on the NIC, but it's all enabled in the open source and open community. So we'll talk about that more in a second. But essentially, it's, a, it's not a vendor lock solution. That's what all of the telcos, all of the cloud customers want. This is exactly, exactly what we're doing. So with that, I want to ha hand off to Frank to talk about um, how does this architecture come together, and what are the different components that we touch, and then um, how do we all bring it together as a solution. Hi, right. everyone. Yep. Is it working? Yeah. So having a great technology is um, very important. And then we need to have it integrated end-to-end -to, -end to have an end-to-end -end solution uh, with open source components. So here, what I'm going to, to show is that people that know SRIOV or people that know OVS will feel at home because OVS hardware offload looks like, from an OpenStack and system perspective, as a mix. You take the best of both worlds in order to, to get your OpenStack um, deployment for NAV. So one thing to, which is really cool about this design is um, because the first package is coming to OVS, OVS takes the choice to uh, offload or not a flow. And when the flow is offloaded, it's also in the kernel data pass. This is kind of something I'm going to show. But if something is not available, like a feature which is in OVS, not in TC Flower, you have a fallback in the kernel. So you, have full, you are full feature from day one. The feature which are accelerated are accelerated. The feature which are not accelerated are going into the kernel. So. All of this is available since OpenStack Queens. So we are post-Rocky. So th this is something that is already there. Uh, the principle of this architecture in OpenStack work with other vSwitches. And uh, the point is, uh, the key elements in this picture are OVS. So OVS is programmed by Neutron via OpenDelight. And the OVS uh, does not see the virtual function that are exposed to the VM. So in the VM, what you see is a VF driver, like SRIOV. And OVS, what it sees is a representer port. For each and every VF, you have a virtual device that OVS is seeing, which is a NetDev in the kernel. 
And uh, from an OVS perspective, it looks like OVS. From the VS perspective, it looks like SRIOV, and you have all OVS features. So to get there, in Queens, developments have started years before, because kernel has to be extended with driver plus TC flower. Then OVS had to be extended in order to support TC flower. QMU, this time, was not touched a lot. Then libvirt, you have a new kind of interface, so you need to add this new kind of interface in libvirt. And once you have key elements that work well, you need to integrate them into a distribution. So let's say CentOS. Once you have a Linux distribution, you need to have the proper SDN that knows about, it knows about OVS, but it needs to know about the little thing about OVS DPDK about, sorry, not OVS DPDK, but OVS hardware flow, then you need to modify OpenStack, mainly Neutron, Nova. I'm going to show that on the next slide. But once you have OpenStack, you need to install it. So this, so you have to modify your installer of OpenStack. So here is Tripelo, uh, OpenStack installer. And then once you have all of these components, you need to have them in a distribution. And once you have a distribution, you need to test it end to end. And you can do that with OPNFV. Just to say that, this is the accomplishment about, uh, of outstanding upstream work in plenty of communities. This is not OVS, this is not kernel, this is not OpenStack. This is all of this community together that can provide this feature. Just for OpenStack, Nova, Neutron, so those are the links and you have also others. Networking ODL, Puppet Neutron for the installation, all that is required to implement this feature. And again, this is only the OpenStack part. Now, let's talk about an NAV typical deployment on top of hardware offload. So on the left, uh, a, a quick DPDK 101. So DPDK is the fastest way that we know today in software to, to, to process packets. So what it, what it does, uh, you have an active loop running at 100%, taking packet, processing packets, sending packets. With the OVS hardware offload, you don't have the PDK anymore on the host, but in the guest, the VNF are implemented on top of the PDK. So you have active loops. So here, I've represented four active loops. So four CPU running full steam, getting packet from a VF, processing it, doing Kaya grade NAT, whatever, and sending it back to uh, another VF. So in order to deploy that properly, you want to make sure that you have a proper end-to-end -end, uh, deployment because NAV, I like to say that NAV, uh, when I make a comparison between cuisine, in cuisine you have ingredients. These are the components. NAV is not a component, this is a recipe. So you need to put everything together and configure it properly in order to have an end to end solution that stands. And this is uh, the tricky part. So a typical deployment of uh, NAV you need to dedicate so uh, each the first core of each NUMA socket to the operating system and host to run OpenStack services. So here is a real example of a triple O deployment uh, for this kind of CPU. So these are real numbers. And uh, the yellow CPU is a CPU that will run OpenStack services, SSH logs, that will take care of interrupt for the disk. So you need to have one CPU for, for, to run OpenStack services. And all of the rest, this is for the VMs. And typically, you will dedicate, you will run flavor with isolated CPU in order for your vCPU not to be preempted. So this is how you deploy it with, uh, with Tripelo. Now, assuming that you all know Tripelo in and out. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of good material, so here, in Tripelo, you have a first deployment, uh, your first deployment file um, that where you specify what components you want to deploy. So it looks like SRIOV. So if you take an SRIOV deployment, you just need to add, uh, okay, here, you need to enable your open daylight uh, uh, ML2 driver, plus uh, after the, the, the VF parameter, switch dev, switch dev. Just two little things. And with that, you're good to go. The compute.yaml is on your compute node how the OVS bridges are laid out. Uh, I've got, uh, I've got one, one bond on the ETH0, ETH1, etc. So this is this file, zero change. You take your OVS, uh, your OVS uh, deployment layout as is. And in your deployment command, you just add, OK, please enable OVS hardware offload. So when we talk about transparent offload, it's really almost transparent from a configuration perspective. 
Now that you have deployed your OpenStack with Tripolo, with your SmartNIC, how do you boot a VM? So you create um, a port, exactly li like you would create an SRIOV port, but you need to add this extra little parameter, binding profile capabilities, switch dev. And you boot your VM, which is accelerated transparently. Under the hood, if you SSH on the host, what you're going to see is the two first lines are the base PF, the SRIOV devices, then you have two VF created on this example, so two virtual functions. It looks like regular interface, except that if you look at the ETH tool capabilities, you have hardware TC offload on. This makes the whole difference. And uh, if you look at the VF, uh, one of the VF, it looks like another VF. So again, people that are used to SLYUV should feel at home. Assuming that you have booted your VM, Nova is generated libvirtxml. And this is exactly, exactly SRIOV XML. Zero difference. In OVSDB, OVS does not see SRIOV devices, right? But OVSDB, for each and every VF, has what we call a representor interface, which is in OVSDB. And the driver is MLX5 rep, rep for representor. So this is the trick. And now, assuming that we have a flow which, have been, uh, which has been um, uh, offloaded, so how does it work? OVS choose to offload the flow. So it push the flow to the kernel and also offload it in the NIC. So the first dump is a, a regular uh, OVS uh, dump cattle dump flow with a minus M option, which is very important. And you see that offloaded, yes, data plane TC. And then it's TC filter show dev uh, to dump the, the, the TC flower. So this is one more framework people have to learn. And you dump with the flow, which are uh, offloaded, and you have a one-to-one -one mapping. And if you want to know more, you just have to look from Queen's documentation. You have all of the details. And with that, demo time. Thanks, Frank. So I've <coughs> prepared two videos today that demonstrate the capabilities of switch dev uh, functionality. Let me uh, just uh, switch gears here and bring that up. Bear with me one second. Oh, I forgot. Let me just set some context here. So let me introduce, uh, first off, the uh, Nuage Network SDN product called uh, uh, Nuage Network's Virtualized Cloud Services. Uh, this is a uh, three-tiered SDN type solution, very typical of many of the other SDN solutions available in the marketplace and in open source. Uh, we have OpenStack integration through an ML2 plugin. Uh, that ML2 plugin contains drivers that are both from open source and also done by Nuage that provide the advanced functionalities that Nuage delivers in, in addition to the open source uh, capabilities. Um, <clears throat> the um, control plane is actually uh, part of uh, the code that's used in our uh, service routers that's been virtualized and uh, enabled to run in, in a virtual machine. So this is uh, instantiated uh, uh, in as many instances as you want, and then you can use BGP to exchange routes between different controllers. So you have a very uh, scalable architecture in this design. And then each um, controller talks to OVS instances. And the OVS that we're going to use in today's demo is, uh, also contains all the TC flower interfaces that have been upstreamed into OVS uh, 2.9, 10, and probably even to 11 at this point. Um, so, so integrated, this provides the uh, complete capability to run OpenStack with software-defined networking and take advantage of the extremely high performance you can achieve by having switch dev or switch on NIC capabilities. And I'd also like to call out um, a lot of hard work that's been done by uh, a variety of people in the community to enable all this to happen. So uh, what you're seeing today here is really the culmination of a lot of hard work by companies like Millinox, uh, Red Hat, and, and so on, who have put all this together and made it um, easily consumable for anyone who wants to put together a working solution. 
So I have two different videos, as I mentioned. The first one will show OpenStack integration. will basically follow the life of a VM that's being set up to take advantage of uh, switch on NIC capability. Uh, the second one, we'll take a look at uh, remote mirroring, just to show you some of the richness of functionality that's being enabled um, in this context. So now, give me a second to uh, change gears here. Right, so this is the OpenStack uh, integration. Oh. Uh, we're having a sync problem here. Yeah, well, my heart is beating again. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, life of a VM. Controlled by OpenStack. I think this is open screen, isn't it? I mean, full screen. Oh, better. Okay. All right. So this moves fairly quickly, but um, it, it follows all the steps that Frank has just showed us. And it's done in the context of a real system, so you'll see, like, real behaviors, not just stuff that might have been, like, written out by hand or something. Uh, and you'll see it in a slightly different context, you know. So Frank was doing open daylight. Here we're using the uh, Nuage uh, SDN uh, controller instead. But, uh, you know, all these things exhibit the same behavior, and they're relatively simple and easy to do. So uh, with that, let's uh, roll it here. First thing I do is run LSPCI to find the uh, Mellanox NIC and identify uh, both its vendor ID and also its PCI uh, bus um, slot and function. I'm, uh, I'm looking here both at the PF and the VF. Now I'm looking at, um, by malice of forethought, ENP 130S0F0, which is the net dev for the first PF on that ConnectX5 NIC and verifying that it has the right uh, bus slot and function. And again, here I just printed out the uh, vendor and product IDs. We're going to edit the nova.conf here to whitelist that particular um, um, set of VFs uh, for use in uh, switch dev mode. So you can see here nova.conf has been edited to contain the right vendor ID. You have to restart Nova um, services after that. Now we have to prepare each one of the compute nodes. And there's essentially five steps I go through when I deploy these. First, you create the VFs. Then you unbind the Linux uh, device net, net devs for each one of the VFs. Uh, then you enable switch dev mode on the NIC itself. That's 8200, if you remember from the previous uh, slide. And then um, we turn on the hardware offloading capabilities and then uh, restart uh, Open vSwitch. Now we're going to jump to OpenStack and actually create a network. Uh, I'm calling this the Berlin Net, just to show you how this works. And then after we create this, <clears throat> we'll attach a, uh, uh, a, a V port, a virtual port, that has uh, the switch dev capabilities. And I'll take you through that. So here you can see the uh, integration created by the ML2 plugin from Nuage. This is actually included with uh, Red Hat's OSPD 13. And you can you have either uh, networks that are managed by OpenStack or by VSD. But either way, uh, the ML2 plugin maintains consistency between the two different uh, environments. So with that now, uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a vPort that has the net dev capabilities. Oh, sorry, sorry, the uh, uh, switch dev capabilities. And here you see uh, it's a port create. And the capabilities are switch dev. This is exactly what Frank showed us here earlier. So that binding is uh, essential. I have a script here that does the, the, the actual function. So I'll use the Berlin net that we just created in OpenStack. And I'll give it the name FB1 uh, for the port. And there we're successful. So far, so good. Now, let's launch an instance and attach that vPort to it. So I'm going to call that VM11. Oh, amen. I lied. <laughs> anyway, we're going, to, we're going to go ahead and create a VM and attach that vPort. Um, now, the important step is coming up here in just a moment, because you'll see where we're actually binding that particular 
uh, viewport that we created. This is just setting the flavor. Uh, we're going to skip attaching a subnet because we're actually attaching a viewport. And there you see it, it's FB1. And then we'll launch it. OK. And then once it's launched, you'll see it show up. There it is, VM11. Now let's take a look at that. Uh, so there was an existing VM22. That's a vert IO VM. Uh, both of these are running on the same hypervisor in this case. And I did that to underscore the fact that you can have both um, uh, 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 switch dev NICs or, or VMs, and also um, Bird IO uh, VMs running in the same environment. So what we need to do here is verify that the XML for the uh, uh, VM actually has the uh, correct uh, bus slot and function uh, for the VF that was assigned to it, and sure enough, it's there. Uh, so now I'm going to log into each one of these VMs. One's Bird IO, one's using switch dev, and um, generate some iperf traffic between them. And then we'll just take a look at the flows, and you'll see um, how those actually show up. And again, using the same dump XML, or sorry, dump um, dump flows command that, that Frank showed us. Uh, Let's we'll just get the uh, traffic started here. I've also taken a look at the IP addresses. These are virtual IP addresses on a virtual L3 network. So this is all being done. Um, through the orchestration of the Nuage uh, SDN controller, the assignment of IP addresses and the ACLs and the ability to communicate. All right, so now our traffic's flowing, and we do a dump flow with the minus M option. And here I'm just going to, you only see the offloaded flows that are uh, using hardware offload. And so you, you can see here there's only a single flow. Um, and that had the hardware offloading. That's because the responding flow from the other VM uh, is not using the hardware acceleration. So, so with that, uh, you see end-to-end -end functionality. Now I wanted to just bring you kind of um, through like the performance stuff in a, in a hurry here so that uh, we don't spend all of our time just talking about performance. Uh, this is a slide we actually shared at uh, uh, OpenStack Summit in Vancouver. And it shows you can achieve uh, you know, well over 50 million packets per second for small packets in a single direction uh, using this capability. So that's over 100 million packets per second, which is enormously fast and probably typically about an order of magnitude faster than what you might achieve with uh, um, a DBDK type deployment. Then we took a look at more and more functionality because that's really where it's at. You know, you need to harness all that capability. So here we do service chaining, and the flows I'm showing you are actually dumped from the NIC itself. So this is a little bit different than using the OBS DPK, uh, DP cuddle command that uh, Frank showed us. Uh, but the flows here um, are offloaded, and you know they're offloaded because they're actually coming out of the NIC itself. And then the next test that we did was just take a look at the virtualized services router. That's a Nokia uh, VNF which is actually uh, a core to a lot of our other uh, commercial VNF products. You know, so our mobile gateway, I believe, is based on that. And uh, it's based on uh, VxWorks. So you know, I was a little bit apprehensive at first about whether or not this would actually work, because you know, with the host pass-through, you have to have the right device driver to talk to the underlying device. You know, you're actually attaching the PCI device directly to the VM. But sure enough, it all worked. And uh, you know, we set it up to do simple forwarding, which is really kind of underutilization of a service router. But you know, it's it's the, the the most basic function you could get from that kind of environment. And you know, uh, fortunately, it all works. So this is really good, and it, it really um, looks very promising in terms of being able to actually put this into production type work. There's still a huge amount of testing going on to validate all this and work out all the bugs and little issues that come up. Uh, it's a long path to get from just having a technology preview to actually having something that's robust enough to actually deploy in real life. So let, let me show you one other functionality where a lot of work has been done uh, to, to enable this, and uh, which I think is quite interesting. And that's uh, remote mirroring. In this case, I'm showing uh, remote mirroring to the underlay. Let's see if we can get back to the start here. All right, now we'll roll it. OK, so here's a setup where we have two hypervisors plus a third system that's acting as a destination for 
a underlay mirror. So uh, on the left, you see the remote destination for the mirror. VM11 or VM11 is, is sending traffic uh, to a remote uh, VM, VM22. And the ingress and egress of VM11 will be uh, based on a match criteria also forwarded to that remote destination on the underlay. So here are the two VMs. You can see they each have V ports, uh, the VM11 and 22. Now I create an ingress match criteria, and this one is uh, very liberal. It, it's basically saying everything. Normally, you would only want to like pick out a particular V port or maybe a class of V ports to forward, but um, here we don't need to worry about that. And then for the action, once we match that, underlay to the mirror, uh, do an underlay mirror, and then pick out the destination, which I called lab one. So I'm going to bind that for the ingress and then apply that rule. So that creates a new ACL. And then we're going to do the same thing on the egress. So we're going to edit this rule, use the same match criteria. And then select an action of mirroring. And again to lab one. So now, once that's all in place, we can generate some traffic and actually see what's going on. So I've logged in here to VM11 and VM22. I've got IP addresses. These are virtual IP addresses that are connected through a VXLAN tunnel. There's also mirroring happening through a GRE tunnel to the uh, remote destination. Somebody's a slow typer. OK, so now we have traffic flowing. Now let's take a look at the flows that are act actually active. And we'll just use the uh, OVSDP cuddle dump uh, flows command. We'll search here, particularly for our GRE tunnels. So you can see our very complex flows being created here. So there's uh, the bottom one is a, um, a, a decap. So a VXLAN packet comes in, it's decapped, and then uh, it's sent both to the remote destination through a GRE tunnel as well as up to the VM itself. And the preceding one uh, accepts uh, uh, packets from VM11 and then sends them out on a, on a uh, tunnel. So th uh, that's pretty much the end of our, our demo here. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to okay. Ash, who will talk about futures. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Um, so we go through one more quick here. We have four or five minutes to finish up the future um, features coming for the obvious hardware offload. The next slide. Yeah, very, perfect. So, um, so some other things I think. So this is work in progress. So, uh, and I think Frank already showed the demo of the port mirroring, but there'll be other features as well. So we'll just touch upon what those features are. I cannot commit to the timelines yet because there's an upstream process. We we upstream Mellanox upstreams all of this stuff into the community for Linux, Linux.org, OBS communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a process to review, and then it gets upstream and into certain kernels or OBS uh, versions, and then it gets into integrated into all the distributions, right? Linux distributions, OB, um, OpenStack distributions. So let's just talk about the features quickly. The demo that we just saw, I just want to recap what, what Mark showed. Essentially, we can do mirroring as a local mirroring, or we can do remote mirroring. So let's talk local mirroring. In this case, uh, there's traffic between VMA and VME that's going on. And uh, VM, uh, VF virtual function zero that's attached to the VMA is the probed interface. And uh, the traffic from VF0 is being mirrored, and uh, it's, it's passed to the VF3, which is connected to the VMD. So that's basically the mirror, mirror port. Now, this is local mirroring because both the VMA and the VMD are on the same host, right? But essentially, the traffic is being mirrored to another port. So you can, you can do this. You can classify all of your traffic uh, based on certain tuples, or you can just say mirror everything uh, that's coming into VF0, egress, egress, ingress, or egress and then put it into VF3. So you can do that, um, you know, basically in this case. Uh, in the remote mirroring, what is happening is you're just basically doing the same scenario, more or less, except that the mirror traffic is not going to a local host uh, or a VM, with a VM on the local host. It's going to a remote host. 
So that could be on a VXLAN, basically an overlay network. It could be across data centers, or it could be uh, with a different tunneling like GRE. Uh, so Mark just talked about GRE tunneling. Uh, so basically, we have already implemented all of this thing. That's proof of concept that you just saw is going to the upstream process. Okay, and same thing. You can again mirror all of the traffic to the remote uh, host, or you can mirror uh, certain uh, parts of your traffic based on how you classify the flows. High availability is another important feature. Uh, as you all know, uh, SRIOV already supports uh, VFLAG. However, for the OVS hardware offload, we need to, have, we need to make sure that the uh, VFLAG is also supported for OVS hardware offload. So essentially, you can implement the OVS hardware, uh, you know, the VFLAG in the VMs if you want to do that, have two VFs bonded, and then uh, each of the VM can make the decisions on you know, how do we want to use those VFs uh, by the bonded VFs. However, that's not scalable. Each of the VFs would have to have that each of the VMs would have to have that uh, support in the software or in the driver. So rather, what you would do is bond the VFs, the virtual functions, in the NIC itself and create a lag. And that lag uh, can be exposed as a single interface, VF interface to the VM. Uh, and then the lag and the, uh, all of the uh, VF lag management happens in the NIC itself. So what we can support in that case is different modes. You can do active and passive, so you'll have two VF functions, but only one active at a time with a single bandwidth, you know, single port bandwidth, essentially. Uh, or you can do active-active, where you can have two uh, port bandwidth, um, or you can have LACP to auto-configure the, uh, the modes, basically, right? So all of those are work in progress. That's all work in progress happening right now, uh, and we are going to the upstream process of reviewing it. QoS, another important feature. And what that is is essentially, uh, you know, ability to control the bandwidth uh, that's going, um, you know, at a VF level. So you can do, uh, you know, you have to be offloading all of this to the TC API as well, um, the TC Flower API that Frank talked about. And essentially, in the bandwidth limit, you have two options. One is either you can do rate limit per VF, and um, that means you can limit the bandwidth uh, to a maximum maximum limit, or you can do bandwidth guarantee uh, per VF. That means you have to you know, allocate minimum bandwidth per VF. So both those max and min uh, available you know, options are basically being, um, you know, we are trying to push those into the community. Uh, also, you can do DSCP marking. And the DSCP marking, you can do it, um, you know, you force the DSCP per VF, essentially. And you can do that in two ways. Uh, you can either take the inner DSCP from the inner packet and copy to the outer packet or the overlay packet. Or you can just set the overlay packet DSCP different than the inner packet. So all those are two different modes uh, that are being also implemented, being in the process of implementing. Uh, connection tracking, very important feature again for stateful uh, tracking of the flows um, and taking actions based on specific um, connection state. So this is a feature that you know we support today stateless um, stateless ACLs in in the product, right? We have the e switch that will do stateless uh, ACLs. We have also a support for now support for connection tracking. In the, in the e-switch as well. However, that support has to be, again, upstreamed and given all the features into the upstream for um, support for the TC to offload the connection tracking. And so how it works is, essentially, uh, in current current scenario, we have um, the um, all of the connection tracking state management is done in the OVS, in the kernel, and uh, it's being pushed by the TC flower into the e-switch for uh, maintaining the state in the hardware. So we are not kind of building the state, but we are maintaining the state in the hardware. So you can see the, the, the CT state um, block in the e-switch. That basically maintains it. So any packet that, that is coming in, once the state information is available, will be fast switched. So that's something that we have implemented already. Um, and it's, um, again, being going through the reviews right now. Um, and essentially, like I said, ConnectX5 is the product that we have where we support um, you know, state uh, tracking based on uh, five tuples. Or we can do TCP flags, seen and act, um, and also we can do um, aging of the flows uh, for the state based on the state information. So all of that is supported today. Again, it'll be all um, you know, kind of coming into the mainstream upstream thing, and then get integrated. We also have a product called Bluefield, which is a smart NIC. Essentially, the smart NIC for us is a um, you know a uh, not only just the ASIC version, but also a version that has an ARM processor next to the ASIC, and that's the Bluefield uh, product. And that can do all of the connection tracking in the software if you just put the whole OVS into it, because it has an ARM processor to 
run uh, all of the OVS on it. So that's something that we can do as well, and that's also the work in progress, where the TCP handshake and the entire connection tracking state machine will be put onto the ARM, um, ARM, um, ARM cores in the SmartNIC uh, called Bluefield. Uh, last but not the least, I want to make sure that you know we talked about one of the key um, you know um, VNFs out there. Nokia has called VSR Virtual Services Router, but there's also some other commercial VNFs that are starting to work and take advantage of the faster uh, data path. And essentially, um, F5 is another vendor that we are working with, and the F5 has a big IP portfolio of VNFs. There's a firewalls, um, you know, load balancers. One of them is CGNAT, the carrier grade NAT VNF. And um, we have um, offloaded, um, using the hardware offload, we are, we are giving a faster data path to this VNF um, to realize about 70, giga, 70 gigabits per second of uh, throughput on uh, F5 uh, CGNAT VNF. Uh, and all of that is without consuming any CPU for the packet processing. Of course, you will use the DPDK in the VNF to be able to process those packets uh, for the NAT uh, function but you don't have to have any of the packets uh, in the OVS um, uh, for, for you know, pushing those uh, packets to the, to the CGNAT um, VNF. You don't have to use that in the OVS at all for, this, for the CPU. So that's basically, um, you know, and this is just uh, one of the VNFs in the F5 portfolio. There's other VNFs which all can take advantage of what we have today. So I think essentially with that, I want to wrap it up and uh, kind of just um, show, tell you guys that you know, the, the smart uh, cloud with the smart NICs um, and the open source way of doing it is all coming together. There are customers who are looking at it, deploying it, at least, for the, you know, at least testing right now, and then looking for deployments. Um, with that, I want to thank you, for, thank you all for your time and uh, for listening to us. Thank you.